Captain Banyas Ball, we're on our way to Caesarea Philippi with our, our hiking tour right now, having a wonderful time. Please keep praying for us. God's doing great things, showing us wonderful things. But tonight you have a very special guest, a man of refuge who's now pastoring in Melbourne, Australia, where Joy and I planted the church. So please welcome Andrew Russell with a great big shalom, shalom, and a round of applause. I love you all. God bless you. Greetings and good day. Shalom. Awesome. Such an honor and privilege to be back home. I've been part of Refuge for over 18 years. I served on staff for five and a half years before the Lord sent us uh, to Melbourne, Australia, the most livable city in the world. It's good to see you, brother. Um, I do have uh, some keychains here and some uh, bookmarkers if you want to be praying for us on a daily basis or when it comes to mind, so I'd love to uh, hand that out to you afterwards. Um, so good to be home. I'm leaving tomorrow night back to um, Melbourne, Australia with my boys because uh, they start school. They've actually, their school has already started because the school system starts now and uh, versus September time. Uh, anyways, uh, last year of... Um, was probably our best year of ministry that we've ever had in the 11, 12 years that we were there and have been there. Uh, some of you know, about two years ago, we got citizenship, uh, so it's great to be an Aussie citizen as well as American citizen ho holding dual passports. Um, but there's many factors in why last year was the best year. And uh, uh, from the growth and health of the church, just ministry opportunities, just seems like you hit your sweet spot after uh, going through uh, seasons of trials and difficulties and how the Lord matures you and He brings in uh, a fresh wave of people that are hungry for the Lord. Um, it was busy also because we put our kids in school instead of homeschooling, so there's the commuting process, which takes about a, a total of two hours each day, uh, back there and back, um, uh, so that takes some time. I'm also a chaplain and president of a large soccer club. We've got 37 teams, and uh, so that keeps me really busy uh, on the other times that I'm not doing church, but you get to minister to so many people. It's a Christian club. We play in a Christian league. Uh, our ladies' premier team uh, won back-to-back -back championships, and the state team won the national championship with our head coach. So um, really cool to see what God's doing there and so many opportunities to minister to people, and that's why uh, God's called me to serve in that capacity for this season. And, uh, but I do want to say thank you so much for your prayers and support uh, after all these years. It means the world to your missionaries. It means the world to us. Uh, when you have someone else holding the other end of the rope and you're on the other side holding the other end, uh, we absolutely need your prayers and support. And, uh, and again, if you would like uh, uh, the prayer cards um, or more information, please see me afterwards or go to the missions table or see my dad. My dad is somewhere around here. I uh, can't see. Oh, he's over there. He's in the back. Uh, but he's uh, faithfully uh, every Wednesday night praying for your missionaries. We love to see more people back there uh, praying uh, every Wednesday, whether you can do it once a month or every other week. But it's going to impact the world when you do that. I just wanted to share a real brief word of encouragement before we get into the, uh, the Bible study. Um, just felt impressed to share with you from a, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We'll be in chapter 16 this evening. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and this is a great word of encouragement for you and for our church back home, as the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. The Lord sees what you're doing. He knows your heart. He knows your prayer. Uh, but just that importance of staying focused and staying faithful to whatever God's called you to do, whatever assignment He's called you to do. Amen? Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we'll be looking at verses 14 through 15, uh, actually th 13 through 14, sorry. And uh, as I was thinking of this, and usually every January, I always think through what the next year entails, the vision and focus, and I reflect on the previous year, 
uh, and the things that were good, things that were not good, the things that you continue, things that you stop. Um, but uh, I always want to have the focus, how do I stay the course? How do I finish well? Whatever assignment he did, whatever year I, I have there, and whatever assignment he's given me to do. And um, I don't want to be a, a, a DNF, uh, did not finish the race, or disqualified. And as I look at the landscape of Christianity, as I look at the landscape of churches and missionaries and pastors, uh, there are so many that are drifting. There are so many who are leaving or walking away uh, or disqualifying themselves or burning out. Uh, doesn't mean what's happening here at Refuge, but it is happening around the globe. Uh, just even considering looking at pastors, 1,500 pastors, according to statistics, leave the ministry each month. 50% of pastors are so discouraged they would leave the ministry if they could find another way to uh, find a way of living. Between 60 to 80% will not be there uh, within 10 years, and only a fraction of that will actually have a career in the ministry. 80% of those who have graduated seminary will leave within five years. The statistics are overwhelming, not to scare you, but it is shocking. And it, even with a lot of Christians, they start out on fire for the Lord, and then something happens. They get distracted, uh, they get wounded, they get hurt, they get betrayed, um, they get let down, their perspective, something happens, and it's tragic and it's sad to see it happening to so many people around the world so, how do we stay the course? How do we finish well? As you all know that we're all on a journey and a walk with the Lord, and we all have different progresses and where we're at. We're all under construction. Um, some are just starting out on that journey. Some are midway in that journey. Some are at the tail end of the journey in life or in ministry. But regardless of where we're at in that spectrum... There are some reminders and words of encouragement and exhortations and words of warning that we need to take heed to. As the Apostle Paul, as he was closing out this letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, with some powerful exhortations to the church there, which are as apt today as it was back then. And we're going to see the first uh, several words within chapter 13 are military terminology as if he's addressing the Lord's soldiers. So notice with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. And let's pray. Father, as we look at these powerful words of exhortation, that you would speak to each and every one of us that we would hold on to these terms and these truths and that we would stay the course and finish well. In Jesus' name, amen. Now keep in mind the context of this particular passage and for this you know, book for that matter. 16 chapters, Paul has been uh, giving words of correction and uh, also confrontation. Because there was a lot of problems that was happening in this church there in Corinth. And that we can easily forget with all this that's going on, that we can forget that really Paul possessed a tender heart. He had a very passionate, caring heart. And he pours out his love for his readers. And so Paul left the Corinthian leaders and readers there with five final imperatives uh, that he determined were especially needed to get the people to the next level and their maturity, and their walk with the Lord, and their practice, and to finish the race, to stay the course. Uh, the first four, as we mentioned, are military terms, and even though it was written specifically to the Corinthians, uh, these commands serve as a very helpful checklist to each and every one of us as we consider how we can stay the course and finish well. The first word to consider, notice, is the word watch. This term describes a guard on duty, uh, to be attentive, to be vigilant, uh, to be alert, to be on the lookout for the enemy, uh, the spiritual danger, to be aware of your weaknesses and potential of areas of spiritual attack. 
when you go on to a military base or any base for that matter, uh, there's a checkpoint there, someone there to check your identification. They need to be alert. They need to be watchful because of the potential dangers that can come through those gates. As the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, stay alert. Watch out for your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The enemy, as you know, is real, and he will attempt to infiltrate the ranks and destroy us from within. You see, if we become lazy or complacent or let our guards down, then he's going to come in and sneak in and destroy us from within if we're not careful and watching. We need to watch for the attacks of the enemy and to stand guard for each other. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand my watch and set myself the rampart to watch and see what he will say to me, and I will answer what I am corrected. You see, a watchman, was uh, his job was absolutely vital. In an approaching army, he left the residence of a a city, uh, ancient city, with precious little time to prepare or to flee. And so everyone depended upon the watchman that was to be alert and what was happening as he peered into the horizon at the earliest glimpse of an approaching threat. It was critical that the people were alerted as soon as possible as what is coming. And as a Christian, listen, God places you as a watchman for yourself, for your friends, for your enemies, for um, against the enemies, uh, for your church family. And it's essential that you are attentive uh, in what God is saying. It may be that you, your family, or your friend, they may be in a crisis, and they need a word from the Lord. They need a word of encouragement. And the Lord may place you in that opportunity, in that position to do that. And as you study the Bible, God may choose to give you those words of encouragement that will change a person's life. And as you share it, and... uh, Maybe your children are facing difficult challenges, and God will speak to you as you pray and reveal how you can help them. If you are spiritually alert, you may receive warnings from the Lord that will address specific dangers uh, that those around you are facing. We're all called to be watchmen. We're all called to be alert. And God holds His watchmen accountable, that you're to be faithful We're accountable for their diligence. So strive to be attentive to every word that comes to you from the Lord in your personal devotion life and whenever you opportunity uh, to gather together uh, at a church body or home Bible study, God wants to speak to you. He wants to speak through you. And as Christians, we need to know about the spiritual battle that we're in, uh, the devil's schemes and plans. And so we take our stand against the devil and his plans. He wants to attack us, but we need to have the full armor of God on. And uh, we need to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and the ministries that God has called us to. If we are blind to the battle or unaware of what's going on around us simply because uh, we cannot directly see it, then it becomes easy for Satan to deceive us in clever and subtle ways and to prevent us from being effective in sharing the gospel or ministering to people. He's going to come in when you're least expecting it. So we always got to have our guard down. And if you notice, the faithful Christian battle, life is a battle. It's warfare. Because when God starts to bless, the enemy starts to attack every single time to get us to keep us down or so we don't move forward in our growth and our walk with the Lord. And for the Corinthians here, as you go through the the book, they were constantly facing issues, uh, the attacks of the enemy uh, that were trying to destroy them. There was division that they had to face. There was pride. There was sin. There was disorder. There was erroneous theology that was creeping in into this church. As you read through 1 Corinthians, you'll notice all that. And as we mentioned, Peter describes him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And here's something that's interesting with lions. If you don't know, they attack the sick, the young, uh, those that are straggling animals. They choose victims who are alone and not alert. The lions prowl quietly, watching, waiting, suddenly pouncing on their victims when they least expect it. 
They use fear caused by their roar to drive their prey into the jaws of another lion. Listen, friends, when believers are alone and weak and helpless and cut off with other believers in their home alone and doing their own thing, they're going to be susceptible to attacks. They can become the focus on their troubles and their circumstances, and their focus is all on them instead of on the Word of God or the kingdom of God. And they forget to watch for danger. In those times, believers are especially vulnerable to Satan's attacks, which comes in various forms. So watch for those pitfalls and the dangers and the threats. Fear, as you know, is one of the greatest tools of the devil, and so is discouragement. Discouragement is one of the greatest tools, because then we just want to quit and and give up. So if we're going to finish well and to stay the course, then we need to be watchful. And I would also say, as a side note here, we need to be paying attention to the end-time events as we are living. There's prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus, Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, it's all lining up with Iran and Russia creeping all into uh, Syria right now. Zechariah 12 with the uh, Jerusalem as the cup of trembling. It's all happening, friends. We're living in the end times. We're on the final stretch before the Lord's return, so be watchful in what is happening. The second phrase that you notice there in verse 13 is stand fast in the faith. And this is a military term to hold one's position. It means to have mature stability, uh, firmly established, especially in your biblical convictions, uh, purpose in your heart that you would not compromise in your convictions regardless of the cost. And notice it's stand fast in the faith, the Christian faith, the doctrine, the Christian truths. Do the right thing. Like Daniel in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. That's living a life of integrity. And with our feet firmly planted and our hearts submitted to Christ, we need to make a conscious decision to stand fast. In the Roman military, again, the men never, uh, within the battle, they never broke the ranks. Five times throughout the New Testament and twice in the Old Testament, uh, we're taught the essential uh, how it is to stand fast, to be resolved, to be immovable uh, in our faith. And that's why it's so important to know what you believe and why you believe it. The Bible's the Word of God. It has not changed. It's the inspired and errant Word. There's no contradictions in it. You can hold on to it. You can stand on it. The enemy of our soul would love to disrupt, discourage, divide, devour, and destroy us. And this is exactly what the enemy of our souls tries to do when we don't make the Lord the top priority in our life or purpose in our hearts uh, not to defile ourselves. And there's many areas that the enemy is doing and going around pounding away every day to try to conform us into his image while the Lord's trying to conform us into His image. And so, one of the things the enemy is going to do is he's going to challenge your identity and who you are in Christ. And he's going to try to move us away from who we are, that you're adopted, that you're loved, and and you're, you know, you're cherished, you're forgiven. And he's going to try to squeeze you into the world's image uh, of who the world thinks that we should be. And one of the things as you go through the book of Ephesians, uh, this idea of who we are in Christ, one of the most powerful books to go through and just knowing who you are in Christ. Because we know that the enemy is going to try to challenge us on that every single day. Along with knowing who we are, we also need to know who God is, that He is our loving, lovingly heavenly Father, and that He gives us His unconditional love and His grace and His unlimited forgiveness. And to know Him as the true God, the God of the Bible, and how God reveals Himself to us in order that we can know Him 
and we could be transformed more into His image. And He will meet us where we are. And He wants us to draw near to Him so we can know Him and experience His love and grace and forgiveness. And it's so freeing. Now, the enemy of our souls is going to be constantly trying to grab our attention and to, to put a hold on you, to, to re-educate you. And this is why it tells us in uh, Romans chapter 1 or 12 to renew our minds because we've been programmed by the world. And if he can get you watching the wrong things and listening to the wrong things and reading the wrong things and going to the wrong things, then he's got us. And the battle for our souls and our minds, and in many cases, he's winning. And this is why it's such a battle in the Christian life, because it's a battle of the mind. And the enemy puts those subtle thoughts in there, the temptations. And let me encourage you and challenge you, don't compromise with the world, with the things that you're watching, the things that you're listening to. And one of the great questions you can always ask, does this please the Lord? Does this glorify Him? Does this honor Him? If it doesn't, then don't do it. It's simple. It's a great, great test. Get rid of the stuff in your life that is holding you back. We all have baggage. We need to get rid of the baggage. We got to deal with the baggage. It's not going to go away on its own. And if the enemy will continue to tempt you to try to take it back, once you release it, he'll want you to take it back. You'll, oh, I missed this. Oh, I remember the good old days. One more time. One more look. And then he wants us to feed on all that the, the material stuff the world has to offer. And you look at all the stuff on the internet or the movies and TV, and it's just constant. Satan wants to be constantly increasing our appetite for the material things of the world. These are the areas that the enemy is going to be constantly working on. So this is where we put that guard up. We take those thoughts captive. And one of the keys, again, to staying the course and finishing well is to stand fast in the faith. And by God's grace, we can, and we can be... Uh, consistent in our time of worship and reading the Word and prayer, and, and we can stand firm by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I personally believe we all need a refreshing and outpouring and drenching of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. We all need to be refilled in our lives. We need the power to fill us and come upon us and saturate us. So stand fast in the faith. The third thing to consider is to be brave. Notice that. Be brave. This term can be translated act courageously or be mature or act like men. The basic idea is that of mature courage, a mature person that has a sense of control, confidence, and courage uh, that the immature or childish person does not have. Because if we have the Spirit of God living within us, we don't need to be fearful. We don't need to be timid or cowardly. You can face your challenges with absolute confidence that you don't have to fight the spiritual battle on your own because the Holy Spirit lives within you. It is His battle. The battle is the Lord's. Living the Christian life requires the courage to resist when others are bound to ungodly norms. Or, uh, and this is where we're not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God of salvation for those who believe. And just knowing that, we have the confidence to share, to minister. The bravery is not the absence of fear, but moving forward and overcoming fear. And some of the bravest men and women I know are those that serve in the military. May we be like them to be brave for the Lord, to be courageous, to witness to anyone that the Lord puts in our path, to minister, to pray for, to encourage them in the Lord. And so Paul understood what bravery was because the Corinthian circumstances called for them to be courageous so they can stand against the false teaching that was going on within that area, to deal with the sin in the congregation, to strengthen out the problems that Paul had addressed earlier in this letter the problems of compromise and division and many other problems. <coughs> and it takes bravery to deal with that, to confront it. No one wants to be confronted. 
It's difficult. So they had to withstand the persecutions and the attacks and the trials. It calls for courage and resolution and focus and determination and perseverance where you don't flinch at this. It's having the right attitude. And there's not a single part of our life that is not affected by our attitude. And your future will definitely be influenced by our attitude and, and what you carry this day forward. So the exhortation here is to be brave, to be courageous, to be determined to make the right choice and make the difference, to be brave to deal with the issues in your life or your relationships, to be brave for the, the Lord and to witness for Him. So, to stay the course and to finish well, we need to watch. We need to stand fast in the faith. We need to be brave. And then fourthly, we need to be strong. We can be strong, firm, steadfast in the Lord in the power of His might, as Ephesians 6 tells us. Because the Lord is faithful to exchange our weakness for His strength. As the Bible says, when we're weak, we are strong through Him. The phrase, be strong here, is in the present tense, passive voice, and imperative mood. And here's what that means. In the present tense, meaning that Paul is saying, be continually strong. So it's not a a uh, once-time thing. It's a continual thing, continual action. The passive voice means that you are the subject You receive the action and the imperative mood, which makes it a command. So to put all that together, here's another way of uh, stating it. Allow yourselves to be made continually strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Amen? Continually do it, day after day. And as we live out our relationships with the Lord, He's going to make sure that His strength is flowing in us. He's going to make sure that we have the strength and the grace that we need for whatever circumstances or difficulty that you may be facing. He is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for our needs. And here's the thing, God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. Now, when you consider that He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world, again, we can stand on those promises. We don't have to be fearful of what the world may throw at us. Remember, the first weapon of our warfare, as you study Ephesians chapter 6, is to be mighty in the strength of God, in His might. And that term, uh, be strong, is used some 33 plus times in Scripture. He's not looking for buff bodies here, but tough in the inner man. One who can stand the ground in the faith and to handle the testings and the trials and the criticisms and the test, uh, temptations and the storms of life. And as you go through one storm after another, you become more confident and stronger and, and you're more refined. Um, when we're visiting, we, we stay out at 29 Palms, um, not too far from the Marine Base. We always do kind of like these little bonfires, and we have steel, and we throw it in there to make it really hot, and we take it out, we start to hammer, and we make some knives and little things like that. But it has to go through the hotness, so you can take it out so you can refine it. It's the the testings and the trials. It refines you so you can be the instrument that God wants to do in your life, and He's going to use you to a greater capacity. And as Paul uh, prayed in Ephesians uh, in chapter 3, for this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the whole Father family is in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to His riches to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. And it's through Him that we have that strength. And I believe that we are strong and we have courage when we are filled with His Spirit, when you're walking in His Spirit. And when we recognize how weak and how insufficient we are, we call on the Lord. And we cling to the Lord. And we make this the constant cry of our hearts. Lord, I can't do this apart from you. You know, and that's our constant trusting in the Lord. You know, that we can't live each day without the Lord. I don't know how people do it, you know, and make it through another day. So we, we rely on, we trust in the Lord for our strength and our courage. And then finally, to stay in 
the, the course and to stay the course and to finish well. It says in verse 14, let all that you be, do be done in love. Imagine every action and every attitude that is governed by love. How radical that would be. This verse is all-inclusive. Uh, all means the whole deal, right? Let all that you do, right? Everything to be done with agape, unconditional love. This command adds depth to the other things that we just covered. Without love, you won't be watching with alertness, but you'll be suspicious of everything. Without love, you won't be standing fast. You'll be running fast from the Lord and from fellowship and from faith. Without love, you won't be brave. You'll be a coward. Without love, you won't be strong. You'll be weak. Love is that key. And having devoted a whole chapter on this, the charity chapter, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, if you want to look at that chapter, we'll go through some of the characteristics and qualities of what this love is. Your love has the specific characters demonstrated by godly deeds, thoughts, words, and actions. And the test of biblical love is to do the following, especially when you don't feel like it, to go that extra mile. And notice in verse 4 there of 1 Corinthians, love is what? Patient or long-suffering. Even when you feel like forcefully expressing yourself, love bears pains and trials without complaint. It shows forbearance under provocation or strain. It is steadfast despite opposition and difficulty and adversity. Love is patient. Love is kind even when you want to retaliate physically or tear down another with your words. Love is sympathetic, considerate, gentle, and agreeable. Love is kind. Love is in, not envious or jealous, especially when you are aware that others are being noticed. It doesn't try to acquire gain for itself. It is an act of the will that seeks to serve and not to be served. Love is not provoked. Even when others attempt to try to... Love is not aroused or enticed by outbursts of anger. It continues faithfully and gently to train others in righteousness, even when they fail. Love thinks not evil or does not take into account of wrong suffered. Even when everyone seems to be against you or people openly attacking you, slandering you. Love does not hold a grudge against someone. Love forgives and chooses not to bring up past wrongs and accusations or retaliation. It does not return evil for evil, but does not indulge in self-pity. Love covers a multitude of sins, which makes it easier to deal with the sins and the offense. Love does not rejoice in iniquity or unrighteousness. Even when it seems like a misfortune was exactly what the other person deserves. Love mourns over sin the effects of sin, and the pain that results in living in a fallen world. Do we grieve? Do our hearts break for the things that break the heart of God? Love seeks to reconcile others to the Lord. That should always be our heart's desire. Love rejoices with the truth, even when it's easier and perhaps maybe even more profitable materially to lie. Love is joyful when the truth is known, even when it may lead others to adverse circumstances, reviling, or even persecution. Love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, even when disappointment seems overwhelming. Love is tolerant. It endures with others who are difficult to understand or deal with and has an eternal perspective in difficulties. God is going to use this for His good, right? Romans 8, 28. Remember, again, love remembers that God develops spiritual maturity through difficult circumstances. When you go through those difficult circumstances, God's refining you. He's developing you. He's maturing you. Now, another way of understanding this particular phrase in this passage 
of love bears all things. Love covers all things is the better word. The Greek word uh, stego means to cover up uh, something in the purpose of protecting it. Uh, And this isn't the idea of covering up uh, as in ignoring the person's uh, problems or sin or whatever it may be. The issue still needs to be dealt with. Uh, They don't go away on its own. But this is the idea of not dragging the other person's uh, sins out in public to humiliate them. If you have a friend or a family member who's got a problem, you don't tell the world about it. That's the idea. It protects it. It covers it up. Love doesn't ignore the person's problem, but love is considerate enough to keep uh, things confidential to cover the sin. The other phrase that we see is love believes all things. This is to place one's faith and trust um, in the fact that God is in control of all things, Uh, that love is able to trust that the unexplained things in a relationship may have a positive explanation we got to give the benefit of the doubt. It cannot mean that a person or loving a person is always gullible or that they should believe things that are obviously false. That's not what it's talking about here. It means that in interpersonal relationships, loving, a loving person believes the best about the other, or at least until the other person might prove that they're untrustworthy. We also see here that love hopes all things. Even when nothing appears to be going right, there is hope. Love expects God's fulfillment of His plan and anticipates the best for the other person. Love confidently entrusts others to the Lord to do His sovereign and perfect plan in their lives. Just trust the other person. Trust the situation and the Lord's hands. The Lord knows what is best. He is perfect. We also see here that love endures all things, especially when you think you just can't endure the people or the circumstances in your life. Love remains steadfast under suffering or hardship without yielding and returns a blessing while undergoing trials. Love endures all things and then love never fails. Even when you feel overwhelmed and the situation seem hopeless, Love never fails. Love will not crumble under pressure or difficulties. Love remains faithful. It continues on. We are not to only do things with love, but in love. It's to have the atmosphere that we breathe, if you will, and the context in which we work and serve and and our homes and everything that should be embodied with love. We are to love God's people because they are His people. As weird and as unique and interesting that (laughs) His people are. Many of the Corinthians, they showed themselves to be critical of Paul. And there was so much um, difficulty that was going on there. Unattractive about their behavior, as the first letter shows, but Paul loved them no matter what. Our love, too, must be for all of God's people, no matter how awkward, how disappointing, how critical, or how immature that they may be at times. We are to love them. Extra grace required sometimes. Love is always the most excellent way. And as we close this message, let's make this our prayer. May we be watchful that we would stand fast in the faith, that we would be brave, that we would be strong, and that all that we do would be done in love. Let's make that our commitment. Let's make that our focus. May the Holy Spirit have His way. Let's do all that we can for the glory of God until He comes. Let's live holy and godly lives that the Lord, He asks us to live, walking worthy of the calling in which you've been called. Let's live lives where there is no compromise or hypocrisy. And the spiritual fitness and the disciplines in our life require watchfulness. It requires firmness of faith, courage, and daily experience with Christ's strength and His power in our lives. And if you haven't fully surrendered to the Lord in all areas of your life, today's the day. The time is now for all of us to be fully surrendered to Him. Stop 
wrestling with God. Whatever issue, whatever struggle you're facing right now, stop wrestling with God. The more you struggle, the more you show yourself more self-reliant than on Him. And when He directs you to take a step or to repent of a sin or a habit, obey Him immediately. Stop trying to earn His love and the gifts that He has planned for you. And here's the thing, friends. He wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. He wants to lavish His blessings upon you, His grace upon you. Stop striving and set your heart on Him. And surely He will lead you to a life at its very best. And may the Holy Spirit speak to you right now in those areas that you may need to surrender to Him. And that you can walk out of here clean and fresh and nude and, and, and all the baggage, all the struggle that you may be facing, dumped. And you walk out of here with the newness of life. Maybe it's your time, your priorities, your dreams, your fears, your habits, your sins, whatever it may be, surrender it all. Walk out of here fresh and renewed, different than you walked in here. The burdens that you may be facing, let it go. Cast your care upon the Lord because He cares for you. And while you're here, I would encourage you, and as the um, guy comes up and does worship, as he comes up, that you do business with, with God as he sings this, this final song, that you surrender. This is your dedication to the Lord. This is the time to surrender to Him. And it is my prayer that you would stay the course and that you would finish well, whatever He has called you to do. Until we die and go home to be with Him or until the rapture, whatever comes first, that we live lives to the fullest. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We thank you for this time that we can look at your word and be exhorted and encouraged and challenged and the things that you're speaking to each and every one of us in different ways through the power of your Holy Spirit. If you're telling us to do something, that we be obedient. If you're telling us to encourage someone, you, you put a verse on our heart or you put someone in our path that we need to pray for, that we be obedient that we would hear your voice and that we'd be sensitive to your voice. So I thank you for each and every one here that you would radically and outrageously bless them, that you'd pour out your spirit upon them. Those that are struggling uh, physically, that need healing, or mentally or emotionally or spiritually, that you would heal them, that you would touch them right now, Lord. Whatever burden that they may have, that they would surrender it to you. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I pray if there's people that are struggling with sin, that they would be able to be set free tonight. Whatever yoke of bondage that they may have, whatever habit that they feel guilty and condemned about, that you would overwhelm them with your grace and your kindness. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So I thank you for each and every one here, that you would radically pour out your spirit upon them, provide for them in a mighty special way. And so, Lord, we want to stay the course and we want to finish well. We can only do that through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.